Okay, now let's turn to our distinguished panelists. First, we have Omoyeli Sawori. Um, he is the founder and editor of uh, Sahara Reporters, and he has been very instrumental in trying to uncover wrongdoing in his native Nigeria. He also ran for president, which I think is suicidal for anyone to try to do that. Um, and he's an advocate for justice, equality, security, democracy, very important topics. Um, and Omoyeli, you started a project that's quite unusual maybe and, and very interesting in Nigeria and in Africa. Please tell us about it. Yes, uh, thank and you, everyone. Here's yes. the clicker. Uh, thank you, everyone, for... Uh, coming, I know it's a very difficult time of the day to have a panel. Everybody just ate, uh, but gladly you have a very comfortable seat so you can fall asleep uh, if we <laughs> bore you uh, in any way. But um, I'm here to just uh, have a little conversation with you about how we cover migration, uh, especially now that uh, migration has become a hot topic uh, in Europe and America where far right. Uh, politics is driving the conversation around migration and uh, it's also somehow forcing coverage to follow along those lines. So it's become so binary that uh, when you talk about migration out of Africa in particular, you are not looking at airplanes, you are looking at boats, you know, that are taking people from Libya to Italy or somewhere else. And uh, this has always been conversations that are driven by other sentiments. You know, sometimes uh, some of them are very, very racist, you know, yeah. in a way we cover these issues. We just look at it and see a bunch of people uh, trying to run away from their continent without understanding that there's uh, been the subject of immigration or migration generally has not always been this way. As a matter of fact, the first set of people that migrated out of wherever they were migrated towards Africa, starting from uh, 1884, when in Germany there was a discussion around how to partition Africa amongst Europeans and they did not even go for visas in those times. <laughs> they just went on boats and wow. partitioned and took over different parts of Africa, the Portuguese, British, the Italians, everybody, you know, that had a boat went to Africa. But today when we are discussing migration, we completely forget the history of migration that it started from here towards Africa. But today, I'm here to give a different perspective to it, you know, that migration is not also something that, or, you know, the attendant issues of migration is not something that have to do with Europe alone. In South Africa, when we, had, uh, when we visited a few years ago, we discovered that South Africans are more hostile towards Africa, other African migrants than they are. Uh, I mean, than some European countries. And this is some documentary we did in South Africa, how South Africans were beating up Nigerians wow. in South Africa. Uh, because they see them as economic uh, uh, parasites in their, con uh, in their country. But you know what? We have to look at this from the point of data. Uh, and what we have here is that uh, uh, African immigrants in the United States pay, pay, uh, US pay over $22.2 .2 billion uh, in taxes. But beyond that, these migrants are also helping their countries. Yes. You know, uh, in Nigeria, more money is coming from people who migrated from uh, you know, Nigeria to different parts of Europe and America, now we're getting from oil, from remittances. remittances yes, right? so wow. we, you know, migrants are actually remitting more money to their home countries than all of the European and uh, American, North American countries concerned with regards to aid. Is that what you're doing in, from the U.S.? Yes, well, I do that <laughs> through Western Union all the time. <laughs> okay. and, uh, and it's also to understand that uh, migrants carry uh, weight to their destination countries. Yeah. Uh, they help, uh, they do great things, you know, they have uh, breakthroughs, both scientific, uh, in arts, and they take whatever they have with them. And you all know that uh, people like Steve Jobs, uh, the guy who founded Apple, their parents, uh, they, they migrated, you know, uh, from different parts of the world. In fact, some of the biggest businesses in the U.S. are off, you know, owned by all strings of migrants, or even yes. migrants directly. And sometimes we forget, wherever we might find ourselves, in Europe and America, that we are migrants. Yes. As I migrated to the U.S. some 20 years ago, yeah. founded a news website that has almost completely changed uh, the direction of news reporting in Nigeria, called Sahara Reporters. So many it. people yeah. did that. And Sahara Reporters was able to do what it's doing because I had a safe haven 
in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and use that place to launch an attack on bad governance at home in Nigeria, corruption. And we broke in several stories. I personally wrote over 5,000 stories until I got tired about a year ago and decided to do what she called suicide. I went to go and run for the president of Nigeria so that we can... And the first thing I, I was confronted with when I visited uh, Italy, I was like, oh, when are you going to stop sending your migrants to us? Wow. Well, I said, when I become president, not only will I stop migration towards you, I will stop you people from migrating towards us too so that you understand how bad it feels when you just scandalize people simply because they are confronted with the need uh, to move and human beings must move all the time. So our solution, which is something we did uh, with Jen in uh, Ivory Coast recently, we, we won an award when this was presented by our team in, in Ivory Coast uh, Trade Gen event, is that we must start to take ownership of the narrative about migration and not to make migration look like it's a crime. You know, we must look at it within the context of global politics and the new world order that when people are moving, they're not just moving because they love to move. There are reasons why they move. Sure. And every story that's covering migration must take into uh, consideration that context as to why people move, why there's dislocation, and why we have all of uh, the issues around migration now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Amoyeli. Okay, now we turn to our other speaker, Blanca uh, Tapia, who's the program manager of the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights. Um, initially, some of you who have the printed program will see the name of Hannah Storm from the Ethical Journalism Network, of which I'm a member, and unfortunately Hannah couldn't join us. She apologizes, but she had an emergency, so, she, uh, so uh, Blanca very kindly uh, agreed to substitute for her, and she's going to tell us a bit about her program. She's the program manager uh, of FRA, EU FRA, Tell us what you do and why it's important and what impact it has. Well, the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights is actually part of the EU. Most Can you talk in the mic? Yes, yes most of you might know Frontex, uh, EASO, the European Asylum Office. Might not have heard about my small agency, the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, which is fundamental rights is human rights, but the EU context, because we have a charter of fundamental rights, let's say it's more rights than the ones that are just in, the, in, in human rights. Um, and I take actually what you have said um, about the importance of words. People talk about economic migrant. I could be myself an economic migrant. I come from Spain. I took a job at the EU. I ended up in Vienna. But I belong to a fantastic category called expats. It looks good. Yeah. Huh? It's much better than economic migrant. And then um, what we know is that this use of words uh, when we talk about migration is something that we've been looking into, not just my agency, but also uh, other international organizations like the UNACR that you put out there, and, and how important it is how we use the words and how important it is also how we, in public information, report and inform about numbers, and it's not numbers, it's people what we're talking about. And each number has a person, has a history, is a human being. So um, going to that, uh, the work of my agency is to really make sure that the human rights of people in the EU are taken into consideration. And I'm talking about people, and here I'm not talking about, I'm not putting labels here. Everybody who is in the EU as a human, as a person, has rights, and those rights need to be respected. And the situation right now is that they're not. So the fundamental rights of those third country nationals, could be you, Nigerians, that are staying in the EU are not respected, and we are telling this to governments, and we're telling this to uh, EU institutions constantly. And we come up every year, every quarter of a year, we come up with a quarterly report and we were talking very critically about what's going on in each member state in each EU country in which they are not respecting human rights. And um, just let me give you some, some information on, on the key issues because you also mentioned about uh, hate speech. Hate speech, uh, political hate speech against migrants. It's racing, it has been racing during the last years. Um, we also have another problem, which is that we know incidents of racism and violence against migrants 
mainly by, from police reports, NGOs, and media. Why? Because member states still don't collect information on hate crimes. Yeah. Okay, so this is also a problem. But it's also true, I mean, some member states do, ah, but, but let others me, let don't. Me, let me, let yes. me interject, if I may. How do you define hate crimes? Because this, this in itself becomes a bit of a controversy. Some people say, well, it's not a hate crime. You know, what is a hate crime? Well, a hate crime How is you when you are trying it? to, when, when it's a crime committed because of who you are, like because you are black. Yeah. And that's the reason why exactly. you are being targeted. Or because you are an, from an LGBT uh, minority group, or you are Roma, right. or you name it. I mean, because I'm a woman. Yeah. <laughs> and just because I'm a woman, then I'm being targeted. These are hate crimes, and this is defined in the law. Now, I'm giving you different examples, but one thing that my agency does is we collect these findings from the victims, I mean, from the people who are suffering this. We do these huge surveys uh, every year on different topics, anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim crime, etc. And one thing keeps always being there, which is hate crime remains highly unreported. The victim themselves don't report it. And one of the reasons... A lot of them are scared, aren't they? Yes, and the reason is, well, because of they are scared or because they don't think that reporting is going to do anything. Or that they have rights. They don't, my, the most reason is, I mean, the highest reason among all the people that we, re, we have asked in our surveys, anti-Semitism, yeah. Islamophobia, um, with, um, because of being black in the EU, uh, LGBTI, Roma communities. The main reason is, if I report it, nothing is going to happen. So why should I bother and report it? This is the main reason. There is also the reasons, like a lack of awareness, which are my rights. Uh, lack of knowing where to go. But this is constantly everywhere. And for irregular migrants who are fearing about their situation to even report this is an issue. But let me just go ahead and move on onto other things which we have uh, been um, actually uh, saying, which is that there has been in the last years um, a situation, uh, in particular in the last couple of years, in which the asylum laws and policies have been, taught, uh, have been made more difficult and more tough in yeah. many EU member states. In, for example, in asylum procedures, more difficult than ever. Yeah. Detention of asylum applicants, also there. National restrictions on the right to family re reunification, well before it was easier. Um, this means that also other things, for example, the lowering of reception standards. Okay, so it, there is a restriction on social welfare benefit. This is affecting in particular children. The, so I can go on and on. Yeah, and we do have, actually, uh, my agency has all this. Every quarter of a year, we say, I mean, we were requested by the EU Commission to provide this information. We started doing it on a monthly basis in 2015. And then we moved on with that. And now it's every quarter of a year we are reporting and we're saying this is actually what needs to be done. And we come up with opinions and we work here with the Greek government, for example, on how to better implement fundamental rights. And there is one key issue, and now that there is a huge uh, amount of journalists here that I would like to, to say, which is the fact that the population in Europe is highly misinformed about migration. Why do I say that? Well, 47%... It's not just in Europe, by the way. Yes, but I'm, I'm talking about yeah. what I know, which is the EU. Yeah. So 47%, and these are figures from Eurostat, think that there are as many irregular migrants as regular ones in their country. Yeah. This is the medium, yeah? In Greece, I think it's 53, 54%, or 57%. Okay. In, in Southern and Eastern European countries, almost half of the population. In other countries, in Western and more Scandinavian countries, it's lower. Okay, that's, that's, I, want, I want to involve uh, both of you in, in a couple of questions here. First of all, and because the focus here is on how to cover the topic, you are a former journalist. You worked in broadcast. I think one of the biggest problems with NGOs and international organizations is they, they talk in legalese or jargon that most people do not understand. The layperson does not understand the jargon of the UN or the EU or a lot of the stuff that comes out in lots of these press releases that are Chinese. 
excuse my French, okay? And it has to be simplified. Something has to, you know, something has to be done about that. You have a big responsibility to make it easier for, for journalists, don't you think? Uh, and for Omiele, I have a question for you. How do you make it easy for journalists to understand the, the big problem in Africa when you have uh, countries that are Anglophone, that are Francophone, that were ex-Portuguese uh, colonies, or you know, and and that have all the different local languages, etc. How do you communicate with them? How do you provide a database that is useful for them through your work? So let's start with you. I think it's uh, first to uh, humanize the stories. Yeah. And you know, whether you're Anglophone, Francophone, or uh, you are Lusophone out of Africa. The most important thing is that we are all human beings. And second is to understand context in which Africans understand these stories. And part of what we need to do for the media, and I'm sorry to say this, is for the media also not to think that, especially European and American media, not to think that when they are reporting things on Africa, they are doing Africans a favor. You know, because what, sorry, I didn't Africans hear. a favor, you know, yeah. as if, you yeah. know, it's the same mentality of the EU, the UN, the US that, you know, oh man, we, these Africans are just suffering, we are trying to help them, you yeah. know. And yeah. it is where context is important to understand, yeah. you know, that sometimes we need to visualize the data and the figures to understand that Africans contribute a lot more to some of your economies than you give to us in aid. But nobody knows, it's just like you said, you call your migrants, you call them experts, we give them paperwork. When we come to your country, you call us all kinds of names. You categorize us, you label us. If that context is not resolved within the reporting of news and stories about migration on the continent of Africa, within the historical context of where you are coming from, what we mean to you, exactly. we are not going to be able to make it simple. You will just be creating one single narrative, which is this demeaning narrative that you're trying to help us, or you're trying to help Africa, or you're trying to help poor people. Uh, and that's, that's dangerous. Okay. Very briefly, Blanca, because I'd like to give the audience uh, an opportunity, and we have 8 minutes and 44 seconds, so if you could answer that question I, I just asked you, and okay. then we can maybe take a few questions if we have time. So your, your question was about uh, why in, uh, public information in these uh, institutions don't make it easier for journalists and for people in general Yeah, because to I suffered when I put saying. together my manual for journalists reading through all the, 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 the treaties and all the press releases and everything. It was just so much mumbo jumbo. I know, and I totally agree with you, and this is my daily fight, and, and the problem is we write a press release that we, under, we believe is understandable, like I, I work in broadcast journalist, and for me it's like, will my mother understand this? Mm -hmm. And go. if she doesn't understand it, then I rewrite it, and I make it Good. simple, but the problem is that then there comes my lawyers. And I'm full with lawyers. So it's one public information officer against 25 lawyers on human rights. And they start changing every single word in every single paragraph. Lawyers. And then, yes, but then, then, uh, then we are slow. Then, then we have to keep ourselves within the frames of the legal jargon. Yeah. Yeah. And then it becomes really difficult. And then I get these phone calls from journalists because I was the spokesperson so you have of the to agency it to them, yeah. and they asked me questions and this is actually maybe we can show a little bit there my, my slide uh, it's just one uh, the first slide and, and what we did was actually and I would like people to know that um, yesterday I presented a, a toolkit actually on media and yeah. it is actually made by journalists for journalists in which in the form of quizzes we try to bring forward this terminology, we try to bring forward what it really means, we try to make the difference okay. between what is a refugee, what is an asylum seeker, there you go. and Good. on all these questions and all these issues that are difficult yeah. to get, what is an unaccompanied children? When we talk about children, we talk anyone under the age of 18, this is what UNICEF says, and so on. Thank yeah, you. I'm looking at the clock here, I'm very aware of these things, having worked for news agencies, Deadlines. Okay, so very briefly, uh, I don't think they have the slide there, but can we, if, if, if there is the slide, if there is Blanca's slide, we'll just show it, but let's take a couple of questions. 
if we have time, because it takes time just to get the microphones around. Are there any questions from the audience? Could we have the house lights, maybe? And if you do have a question, please state your name and what you do and who you represent and to whom you're addressing that question, please. Um, could we have some house lights on, please? My, my name is Azu. Where are you? I'm, I'm sitting right here. Just here? Uh, there? Right across from Hi. Me, yes. Okay. Hi. Yeah, my name is Azu Ishekwini. I am the editor-in-chief of the Interview magazine, and it's based in Nigeria. My question is to Shure. I mean, I, I, couldn't be, I couldn't express any more eloquently than you did the, uh, how the whole problem of uh, migration is covered by the Western, uh, largely by the Western, a large section of the Western press. But my question has to do with coverage of migration by, local, by journalists in Africa themselves. I mean, do you think that there is sufficient filtering and understanding of the issues by African journalists covering events that have to do with migration in Africa as it affects Africans. Because often what you find is just a complete wholesale repeat of the news that we get about these migrants from the Western media about Africans in Africa. So do you think there is sufficient understanding of the issues by African journalists themselves of the, of, of the problems that we are faced with and what solutions we need to deal with them? Thank you. Let me quickly say yes, uh, there is, but the Africans must own their own narrative as well. Like you rightly said, most of the time what you hear about migrants are the same things that are written from the West, just repeated by most African uh, journalists. And part of it is also for Africans to be introspective to understand that some of the migration issues are also happening within African countries, like we did about South Africa. You know, for example, we don't like to admit it, but in 1983, Nigeria drove Ghanaians back in, with their little bags, what they call Ghana must go. You know, that is even more wicked than what Europeans do to Africans today. But what needs to happen is for more media uh, in Africa to own their narrative about things that are happening about Africa, not to be afraid of it. And most importantly to Jen, to have more African journalists be keynote speakers at your events so you can hear us out and know that we are covering our events as much as you are covering us as well, not just a one-way traffic in which you are always covering us and you don't even understand that we cover ourselves as well, better than sometimes most European uh, and American journalists do. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, maybe? Um, do we have... Hello, yes. okay. Peter Harrison, Arab News. Um, forgive me for asking you to repeat some of what you've spoken about before, but there's a lot of semantics, there's a lot of perception about words, and you both touched on the notion of expat versus economic migrant. Now, I live in Dubai. I'm British. I refer to myself as an expat. Other people refer to me as an expat. What you're suggesting is I'm an economic migrant. Is the perception, though, that an economic migrant is somebody who moves out of necessity? I was lucky enough that I got bored of living in England and then thought, well, stuff it, I'll get a job in Dubai. I got bored the other day, so I went and bought myself a nice bag. In people's minds, an economic migrant is not somebody who's so lucky. And finally, the, the migrant versus immigrant. I mean, <clears throat> I'm always having arguments with my newsroom about the notion of the, the term illegal immigrant. And I always say, nope, <laughs> you can't be an illegal immigrant because in my understanding, to be an immigrant, you need to have signed papers, you need to have done documents. So, I don't know, I, I guess what I'm asking is, what about the perceptions? What about the semantics? What about any of it? If I, if I may answer that question, Peter, I strongly recommend you read my manual because it spells it all out. All the terminology is there. It's very easy to figure out, and um, it'll help you for better coverage. Okay? Quickly, we've, got a, we've got a minute, minute 31. Yes, let me just yes, go ahead. fully jump into that. Please. Dubai is a great example of what we're talking about. You are British. You're an expert. 
There's also a Nigerian that traveled the same way to Dubai the way you did. He's not referred to as an expert. Yeah. The person from Malaysia is not referred to as an expert. Exactly. You know, and or this idea of calling or people India or, yeah. illegal immigrants is, is actually an English word, illegal immigrants. So you guys started it, uh, and we need to start changing those languages. You need to change the vocabulary at the EU, in Britain, and in the U.S. Sadly, sadly, if I just may interject here, sadly, there's an awful lot of racism and xenophobia attached to all of that. And we are in the land of the country that uh, created the word xenophobia from xenos, foreigner, the other, you know. Uh, I know some Greek. Go ahead, Blanca, you have a final word there. Yes, just only to say that there is no human being who is illegal. Illegal, he, they person could have entered a country in an irregular manner, but a person itself, a kid, a human being, is not an illegal person. So you, you can talk about the person being irregular, and I understand that for many people, and, and the use of words are crucial, and I'm not saying that in the EU they have chosen the right words. When the hotspots started, and, and they were first put there, I was answering phone calls from journalists asking me what, what is exactly going on with the hotspots. And I had to be talking with my colleague from Frontex and ask her, how are you explaining what we're doing in the hotspots? Because Angela Merkel is describing hotspots as X, Macron is describing them as B, the Commission is describing them as C, and how the hell do I describe them now? And this was actually, so it took us all uh, at that moment really like what are the right words to use? And it took us time to think about it. So I'm not saying it's the fault of the journalists. I'm not saying, I, I do also think that there was a lot of fault from our side on how we did things. But we, I talked to Isabella Cooper every three days in Frontex. How are you answering these questions? How are we going to deal with it? Trying to, within ourselves, reach a consensus. And this was actually one of the things that I think was crucial. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Magda team, thank you so much. Really enjoyed that. There's so much of that I'm sure many of us can resonate. Now